and I welcome you all to this uh, panel discussion on frontier technology and policy solutions to manage aquatic ecosystem in collaboration with the European Geosciences Union, Global Policy Insights, and NVPOL. We thank you all for joining us in this really interesting discussion, and we hope that you're all doing safe and well in these times. Uh, can I please request the audience to just uh, keep themselves mute? Thank you so much. Now, um, I think those were some really heavy words uh, that I spoke uh, and that I said in the sentence when I was revealing the topic of this panel, you know, I mean, frontier technology, policy solutions, and perhaps even aquatic ecosystem. But I think the idea behind this is to really break it down in easy words for you so that we can understand the crisis, the challenges that the aquatic world is currently in, and perhaps even bring about a concrete understanding of it thereby discuss some solutions in understanding what the way forward is for it. Now, it's a known fact that the aquatic environments are affected by multiple anthropogenic stressors like overfishing, climate change, pollution, coastal erosion, habitat loss, and I think what not. I think this continued degradation of the aquatic ecosystems have suggested that innovative approaches are needed to support the initiatives and to protect the equated ecosystems and move closer in fulfilling the goals which have been laid down in the, in the sustainable development goals. The use of frontier technology in the form of artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, it offers a range of opportunities that have helped and proven to be of a significant impact on the environment. <clears throat> it is of utmost need, I think, to also examine how the policy measures can expand their potential benefits. After all, when policy and technology are put together, it can yield some really concrete impact in the best way possible. With the aquatic biodiversity being put to a great risk in today's time, considering the pre and the post pandemic situation, it is of utmost importance for us as young policymakers to really discuss what more can be improved on and talk about new models and new ideas in protecting the marine life. I think we have with us the best of the panelists and speakers who will be lending us their thoughts and ideas in the form of policy solutions in managing the aquatic ecosystems. They are experts in their own specific field of work and they boast of some wonderful knowledge and experience in studying and understanding such issues. They are our current and past GPODS fellows, and I'm sure if you're curious to know what the GPODS fellowship is all about, uh, I'll be posting this in the chat box in a while, and we would request you to please check out our website and follow us, uh, check out our social media pages and follow us everywhere because uh, we are there, out there in the social media world so that we can stay connected. It would be great if uh, the panelists could just wave your hand, if you can just wave your hand and cheer us uh, with a big smile as I call out your name and introduce you all, right? So first and foremost, we have uh, Swasti Raizada. She holds a degree in engineering and public policy and she's currently serving as uh, a senior consultant at Deloitte, right? Uh, so we so the next person that we have is Krishnapriya Vagla, who's uh, fondly known as KP, and she has previously worked as a senior associate at Vedanta Limited, and is a brilliant energy and environment lawyer. Next we have with us Neha Naikwari, who's currently working as a program manager at the Climate Collective, which is a non-profit focused on unleashing innovation and entrepreneurial ta talents to solve environmental challenges. And last but not the least, we do have Yunusa Sahib, who's a WASH consultant. And I'm sure that he's also going to lend us with some really interesting ideas. Yeah. Of course, we also have Prabain, who will be co-moderating this session with me. And uh, I think I'll be now coming to each one of you and maybe ask you for your own specific thoughts and reflections on this topic that we have uh, chosen for this panel discussion. 
and maybe just get to know from you in your own words as to how you perceive the whole uh, I think let's just go on to Swasti maybe. Thank you, Shristi, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so I'll probably kick off with uh, some bits on what Shristi already spoke about in terms of defining what frontier technologies are, how we are seeing their deployment at uh, local levels, and we're seeing these very interesting case studies emerge as a global community. And as we go forward into uh, what is now being coined as the fourth industrial revolution. I don't like the term personally, but uh, uh, I think we, we probably as a global community need to think about some of these uh, things in terms of what are the policy challenges and how can we, you know, as a community sort of get our heads around them. And if at all, can we anticipate some of these challenges as they may arise when we once we start deploying some of these frontier technologies. So uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, talk uh, a lot about uh, all the possible pro policy challenges because I think there's going to be a ton going forward, but I want to sort of structure my argument around four key points. Uh, the first thing that we are seeing, and I think uh, KP in her part will speak extensively about this is that we are seeing a lot of these uh, uh, you know niche studies being done by oceanographers by climatologists by uh, uh, and and you know we are seeing a lot of like uh, deployment of technologies like uh, uh, use of sonar uh, lidars uh, even like uh, what is called remotely operated vehicles which is basically essentially you attach a hd camera and there's a there's a device that you sink into the oceans that helps you collect a lot of data in terms of the topography of the seabed. It helps you also take uh, images that help, then helps you do a lot of 3D mapping of the ocean floor and the uh, you know ec ecology within these uh, aquatic systems. And then there is there are like uh, uh, a lot of eco sounders, for example that are used, uh, but we are seeing like these uh, very niche studies across the globe happening today that are sort of informing policy thinking around the world. Uh, but even today, we, we sort of like still in a fix in terms of how to think about these technologies in a very global paradigm. So there is a lot of local action and a lot of like uh, uh, community action around that. But uh, essentially those studies are sort of throwing up a very broader overarching theme which is that going forward uh, all our preservation conservation and management mm -hmm. efforts of aquatic ecology will require more of systems thinking and when i say systems thinking uh, you can uh, consider this as essentially an approach where uh, we as humans sort of attach a mental model to the way we look at policy problems and uh, these mental models are then essentially driven by a function of what's the information that is pouring in and what is our thinking behind processing that information, you know. So essentially what is happening through these high uh, high end frontier technology is that the science is now gradually evolving and we are seeing this across issues like climate change, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, even uh, uh, 3D printing, for example, has multiple applications in manufacturing, supply chain and all of that. But essentially that like, the science is becoming more and more advanced and it's evolving and it's throwing a ton of data back. So uh, the question then becomes that as if you envisage your mental model as a function of your information and your thinking, the information is becoming more and more refined, but that also essentially requires a new age thinking to how we then develop these new age mental models, which is essentially being able to think more circular. Historically, we our thinking has been more linear when, when we look at these problems. I mean, like uh, uh, we, we used to think about how to uh, address the challenge of plastic. And one of the initial uh, debates was let's just ban it, right? Which is linear thinking, but we are looking at these 
uh, impacts of microplastic, nanoplastics, and how like they've been accumulating in the ocean over the years. And maybe we will require a more nuanced discussion around some of these solutions that we will need for uh, you know uh, policy solutioning of these challenges. So I think what what I want you all to probably take back is that there is a more there is a growing need to look at these policy uh, look at these uh, problems in in a more systems thinking approach and uh, uh, once we do that i think as a global community we will also see these new age roles emerging for our traditional experts in this space i mean like earlier we used to rely on a lot of scientists but the whole umbrella of scientists is now evolving into oceanographers climatologists and then how can we you know as policy makers enable all of them to come together on a single platform and then inform uh, these uh, you know this knowledge sharing and how can young policy makers like all of us here or young parliamentary parliamentarians or young leaders ambassadors to uh, our nation states be then informed and adequately have that understanding of how to challenge that big data you know because uh, essentially that's also going to be a new age skill that will be required for policy solutioning the second point that i want to talk about today is uh, there's going to be there's this this entire deployment of uh, top down technology is also going to require a lot of uh, uh, you know getting our heads around uncertainty and if you probably are aware of the entire debate of climate change climate change is is something that is uh, you know in a sense pushed by uh, uh, by our thought leaders in terms of what is the probability of this event happening right so we have our targets around 2050 we have a target around the end of the decade but there's but the urgency then arises with the with the concept of how uncertain it's going to be or how certain it's going to be and that's essentially like a very critical aspect of how science drives policy solutions so one thing that uh, probably you you should i i think take back is how can policy makers then work with the scientific community in terms of quantifying some of those uncertainties so today for example if if we are uh, sort of developing these studies around what our coral reef health is today in the ocean and what is going to be 30 years down the line that timeline will have a certain degree of uncertainty in terms of predictions so then how do we sort of get our heads around as policy makers in terms of which intervention will require urgent action and which of it can be deferred and that's going to be critically driven by what is that degree of uncertainty in the solution that we are providing and the third point that sort of is a is a segue into my previous point is that essentially these solutions will therefore require a short term mid term and a long term approach there are certain uh, uh, studies that are now providing that sort of scientific signaling to policy makers uh, and and the current knowledge is sufficient to take action today but then there are going to be some studies that still need more evolution in terms of uh, uh, just the advancement of technology and maybe we are not there yet so for example like uh, there are a lot of studies today being done by uh, noa uh, Uh, there's a whole study uh, and probably you can read about it the noah ship nancy foster which is essentially uh, essentially a ship that uh, you know or, throughout the year they do extensive studies in terms of uh, 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 you know collecting data from the seabed in the caribbean and uh, that's sort of throwing up very very interesting insights in terms of how to manage our coral reefs and maybe then it sort of feeds into our policy that maybe we will need to increase or uh, think again about the regulations around marine biodiversity hotspots so we will might we might have to increase the hotspots if we want to achieve that x percentage of conservation right so essentially like those are studies which are highly evolved now and probably we need to take action today but then there are some studies and some areas like you know use of space technology to solve some of these uh, problems here on earth that require a bit more investment from the global community before we can probably sort of get our heads around what that intervention should be and the last and most important point that i personally believe in i think is essentially who the question of who owns the data underlying our global commons when it comes to you know uh, 
deploying frontier technologies and especially at the scale of aquatic uh, maintaining uh, the health of our aquatic ecosystems you know because what we are seeing is the 70 percent of the earth's surface is covered by uh, you know our aquatic ecosystems and then this collection of data is going to be massive going forward so who owns this data because uh, these resources are global commons and do we then say that this data should also become a global common because today we don't have that sort of a global governance framework we are seeing uh, work in pockets in terms of like uh, and and these initiatives are primarily being driven by big tech companies like amazon google uh, today you know so uh, uh, will that materialize into commercialization of that data or uh, and there's there's a huge risk involved in that because then essentially the players who've historically been involved in exploiting some of those uh, resources can continue to do that using the same data uh, if we do not act today you know so i think one of the key questions is how do we then define a global governance framework around the use of that data that is being collected uh, using some of these technologies and most importantly, will that lead to a technological divide between developed nations versus developing nations? Because most of these investments, most of these studies are today either funded or based, geographically based, uh, in developed nations. So it, it becomes a very critical aspect in terms of how can that technology be transferred to developing countries and how can there be an equity in terms of how nations can leverage some of these frontier technologies for uh, protection of our aquatic ecosystems. So I'll pause there because I know I've spoken a lot and I'll probably let uh, others take over. But uh, I think I just, uh, I just wanted to uh, touch upon these four points so that they become essential, critical uh, food for thought when you go back from this uh, event today. Thank, no, thank you. you so much, Swasti, for really opening up the entire discussion for us. And I think those reflections that you had uh, in regards to the topic that we are going to talk on, I think they were just wonderful. And I'm sure that we have so much more to hear from you again. So I think we'll be coming back to you. And I think it's time for me to now really pass on the virtual mic to my co-moderator, Praveen, so that he can then take over and, uh, um, you know, ask the others, uh, the other panelists to speak on particular issues. So over to you, Praveen. Thank you. Uh, and I think uh, Swasti has made quite clear that the call for action in regards to implementing frontier technology is more than ever uh, now. And I think as policymakers, the first thing we need to establish are the key challenges which exist in the in this field. So I would like for Saeed and uh, Neha to take over and introduce what are the major challenges which are currently uh, faced in the aquatic ecology, which can possibly be countered by frontier technology. So I would give the mic to Saeed. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Praveen. Uh, as we all know, the world is actually in crisis. I mean, water crisis. There are a lot of insufficient water around. And according to Copen, who happened to be um, a very renowned scholar, water scholar in South Africa, he at one point said, uh, water scarcity is, is an issue of water appetite in South Africa, where the white people were all the rich guys have access to water and the poor people do not have access to water and this has to do with the growing impact of climate change with insufficient water around the world what is happening in south africa is happening in other countries of the world but what is important is how is the water body being managed what are the policy instruments what are the what are the what are the uh, technology that actually been put into the management of water resources I could tell you, like a case in Uganda, there was a policy to protect the wetland. But up to today, I'm telling you, wetland has given way to roads, wetland has given way to buildings, and it's not properly managed. These are ecosystems that help us to um, naturally purify our water. You don't need a gigantic wastewater management plant when you have wetlands available for your water to get purified. You don't need oh, so much of a pod system, which is a very good technology that was actually implemented in the Netherlands to be able to cover or to protect your city from flooding. Wetland does that in a natural system. But while this natural ecosystem are growing out of 
hands or out of security in most of the countries simply because it's giving ways to roads, it's giving ways to, to buildings. There's a need for new technology to be able to monitor the ecosystem itself. And that's exactly why I'm very much in support of establishing what is called citizen observatory. It's currently in existence, but it needs to be updated. We're all used to technology like Anfo now, and information is quite accessible. Why don't we have a app that is going to enable citizens in every community to be able to monitor their water bodies and be able to report it to the government so the government can easily take actions, even if they're going to be politics. But the, the policy of allowing people to be the watchdog of their own water bodies, I think it will go a long way to be able to help people to monitor what is actually um, how they have been impacted by uh, the water situation. And also across country, there's what we call virtual water transfer. I could tell you some countries don't rear cattle, but they buy it from other countries in order to be able to uh, secure the water, uh, water sector. If we do have people that have this uh, citizen observatory where all this transaction are going on. Some of these transactions are actually not plain. People don't know about it because in some countries, they don't go flowers, they import flowers and they're importing the water system and it has a cheaper rate. So some of these countries are becoming more drier than expected while that country is securing their water system. I think during this wise, we need to ensure that technology, uh, citizen science most especially where people capacity is actually being built to be able to report the water situation in their country i think that's uh, uh, that's a very good um, in my own opinion a very good approach and perspective and that will also strengthen existing policy thank you thank you for that i think uh, neha could take over and introduce what are the other challenges which currently exist and which we would aim to tackle in this panel. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, thank you, Vivian. Um, thank you, Said, for touching upon uh, most of the inland challenges. Then I think I'll focus more on uh, the estuaries and their uh, importance and also from the biodiversity uh, perspective. So for those of you who don't know, estuaries are basically uh, the transitional areas between land and sea. You could call it freshwater and uh, salt water environments. Now, these estuaries support abundance of uh, life and uh, they are very diverse uh, habitat types. These could include oyster reefs, coral reefs, rocky shores, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, marshes, and mangroves. Uh, uh, like uh, in the whole climate debate, uh, a lot of these habitats have been uh, gaining importance. Now, uh, why is that? That's because a lot of thousands, like a lot of birds, mammals, fishes, and other wildlife depend on uh, these habitats to live, to feed, to reproduce. Uh, they provide support to migrat migratory species and to the species who rely on sheltered water for um, their reproduction and so on. So basically these estuaries are like the nurseries of the sea. That's uh, that's their uh, biodiversity importance. Now, uh, a lot of organisms at some point in their life uh, depend on uh, these estuaries. This makes uh, them pivotal in terms of the overall balance of the marine ecosystem. Uh, when I say marine, it includes the whole 70% uh, of our planet. Now, uh, these ecosystems also uh, are, uh, have a lot of indigenous importance and that, uh, that leaves a lot of scope for scientific research in here. Um, now, speaking uh, from the climate change perspective, it, uh, they have a lot of importance as uh, carbon capture or sequestration. Uh, we usually think that the forests are the heroes who um, were you know, taking a lot of carbon dioxide but uh, the studies show that uh, estuary sediments can, uh, you know, store up to 10 times, uh, store the carbon up to 10 times faster uh, than the sediments in the forests. And if they are left undisturbed, they can store uh, this carbon below ground for thousands of years. Uh, 
um, now that's how important these ecosystems are and this can make a huge difference in the whole you know climate fight but then why why are we not protecting them that's uh, that's the maybe a good question of the talk uh, because these stories have huge cultural social and economic value like historically a lot of major cities on the coastal areas that you see have been based on these stories and there has been massive extraction of resources for the whole civil uh, civilization development that has taken place around these estuaries now if we were to put a number on this the coastal watersheds have provided 17 million jobs and about uh, they have contributed about 8 to 10 trillion dollars in gdp over the first uh, decade of 21st centuries to the coastal uh, in terms of the coastal countries we could also consider that as global now i think i'm speaking a like my time is about to be up so i'll just go ahead and you know mention some of the uh, problems that are impacting these estuaries that would be embarking creating a uh, shipping ports oil spills excessive harvesting invasion by introduced species that means whenever the ships come on the port they bring in uh, invade uh, species which uh, invade the original ecosystem and disturb the delicate balance over there reclaiming uh, land by drainage america has in fact uh, you know converted a lot of these estuaries into uh, agricultural lands by filling them then uh, extracting sand salts uh dumping of plastic sewage industrial waste and uh lately uh, aquaculture or monoculture is becoming very famous in terms of you know uh, harvesting important uh commercial species uh, on the coast in the coastal areas to feed our population so these are basically uh, the problems now where does frontier technology come in if we were to name a few be it ai autonomous manual technology or edge computing microchips green tech all of this can be put to use in many ways in each of these stories now they are all unique one solution cannot fit all but if we work with the local communities to come up with you know the local solutions to tackle the problems in a particular ecosystem we could get there eventually maybe so yeah that's that's my remark uh, i think kp will touch more on the importance of the local communities so i'll leave it to that thank you thank you neha for that and um i think the challenges which currently face us in the quarta ecology and how frontier technology can be implemented in that have been very well covered by both you and said so thank you for that but i think in terms of policy making we need to understand that it is not a new idea that frontier technology needs to be established for aquatic ecology but uh, there have been certain issues with implementation and i think the best way to understand what that would be to go back to previous cases which there have been attempts to introduce frontier technology and i think kp could take over in that and uh, give us a big some better information on how these policies have been enacted out in the past and how these policies could enact out in regards to frontier technology and aquatic ecology so um, kp i think i you could take over right uh, thank you so much praveen and so i am going to draw a lot from what sakti had mentioned earlier and from neha and sakti's points so my focus essentially is on the role of community engagement and the role of local indigenous communities and indigenous and traditional knowledge in you know aiding in their uh, them aiding in the successful deployment of your frontier technology because more often than not the way the mainstream view generally is that you know technology solutions are a panacea and that they will solve the problems but like neha has also mentioned each and every ecosystem is unique in terms of how people you know derive value from it and what kind of species exist in that particular ecosystem so our our solutions and our policies have to you know take that into account so we cannot have a one size fit all solution like neha had mentioned so uh, there have been many you know it's already very well established that uh, community engagement and community participation and participative decision making lead to successful policies right because you are 
considering the inputs of the people that are getting affected by your policy you are taking their you know uh, lived experiences into account when you're making the policy and that becomes very central especially when it comes to managing ecosystems because uh, a lot of livelihoods depend on it and so for example if you take the so drawing in from estuaries uh, that neha was mentioning so let's talk about the sundarban delta right so it's a very unique ecosystem and it's been recognized under the ramsar convention now but around 4 million people both in the northern side and the southern side of the you know delta depend on the sundarban ecosystem for their livelihood and the sundarban ecosystem is also home to many you know threatened and critically endangered species right so when you talk about deploying technology solutions like for example uh, i was uh, as part of this uh, you know panel discussion i was reading up a lot on it and there are quite a lot of interesting tech solutions right so there is a robot that eats invasive species in australia that is being used in the great barrier reef right so for example but when you talk about trans transplanting that technology in say so they say the sundarbans you can't just do that you have to take into consideration the role and the impact that it would have on the local communities and again sahid had also mentioned uh, you know citizen observatory right which is again you know the trust is on your local communities and how they can aid in the protection and in the management of a particular ecosystem so drawing from that uh, there has been uh, you know a study in uh, you know in africa on the lake victoria wetlands wherein uh, the local villages were consulted and uh, because there's a lot of waste discharge that happens and it's not treated properly and it has like a circular and a it creates a vicious cycle where it impacts not only the ecosystem itself but also the health of the people that are dependent on it right so then your technology and your solutions have to take all of that into consideration and we also have to understand that we do not live in a world where everybody is equally informed right and especially if we look at uh, aquatic ecosystems and those that live around it they are more often than not marginalized communities and they are tribal communities that have always historically been excluded from your mainstream development activity so there is a clear digital divide there right so when you talk about deploying things like you know internet of things to you know facilitate the flow of information you have to think about capacity building you have to think about training the local communities you have to think about working together with the local communities so uh, my uh, and there have there have been many instances again uh, i'm just going to talk about a parallel here for example uh, with respect to treating uh, and controlling uh, avian flu outbreaks in southeast asia so the food and agriculture organization sort of collaborates with the local communities and uh, trains them to you know recognize the symptoms and to alert the local authorities when you know they think that there will be an outbreak so the local authorities can then take the necessary action to mitigate the damage right so here what's happening is you're not only using your technology you're using your information flow and you're using you're giving them a cell phone to take pictures but you're also teaching them you're teaching them to recognize problems right which is very important and another uh, thing that uh, was very interesting to me because we talk about ai like it's the be all and end all right it's like it's the answer but then we also have to consider that you know now there is a lot of talk about AI, you know ai bias right so then when you talk about uh, managing very unique ecosystems that are that you cannot find anywhere else and that are very critical to the overall health of are entire aquatic ecosystems because like your fresh water then flows into your marine life right like for example the health of an estuary then impacts the health of the marine ecosystem the health of your coral reef impacts the health of the high seas and vice versa right so then the only way to sort of tackle that would be to incorporate the inputs and the traditional and indigenous knowledge into you know i'm not a technical person at all i'm a lawyer so i might you know be making a little conjectures here and there so forgive me but the way i see it the only way to address this bias then is to incorporate the lived experiences and the inputs of you know the local and the indigenous communities right because there is no other way that a policy can work because if you're 
coming in and you're in, introducing something completely alien that will not only the local committee not support that particular intervention but they will also the policy will also not succeed right and as a future as the future generation our job is to ensure that we make successful policies and that we you know that we balance the needs of the livelihoods of the people that are dependent on a particular aquatic ecosystem and the health of that ecosystem because they are very interrelated right they're very interconnected and that is also something at a broader policy level uh, that needs to be understood as well and i think swasti will talk more about that but uh, i'm just going to again you know give a little little anecdotes here and there so if we talk about the whaling convention right the whaling convention only talks about protecting the whales right and prohibits hunting of whales but then there are so many marine species that are dependent on one another and there is no overarching you know policy framework at the international level and it is very difficult to achieve that as well because consensus building at an international level is an extremely extremely difficult process uh, so uh, that's uh, my two cents and i might have a couple more cents to add later but for now uh, yeah i think we can go on to the next very talented um, person in the panel uh, yeah uh thank you for that and i think quite an interesting point which does stem out from that which you talk about is that a lot of indigenous communities are the ones which need to take the uh, which are the ones which are most connected to these uh, take ecologies so for them there also needs to be a form of incentivization structure which needs to be present because a lot of them uh, due to their uh, disconnect from the rest of the world as you talked about they do not understand or they are not aware of how exactly can um the ecology and how it can long term impacts on the ecology be detrimental to their society so they need to be incentivized in a way that they need to be held account they need they need to be uh, they, need, they need to be more aware of the fact that what are the long term impacts of this aquatic ecology and how, how why they need to implement frontier technology because if they do not have a incentive or if they do not find a need to implement it even if you do provide them a technology I, they will not add or go on and work towards it because of the fact that they're not aware or they're not finding the incentives to follow it so for a state or for any government in order to uh, uh, add frontier technology to their aquatic ecology they need to ensure that people who are involved in the daily uh, interactions with this ecology itself they understand that there is a need and there is a requirement for this frontier technology to be used because otherwise there will be no incentives and there would be no reason for them to implement it and even with providing the technology it might not provide the results which policy makers look for in speaking of policy makers i think where shishti could come in now is that she could talk about what are the policy challenges which lay ahead of us and what could be possible solutions where which policy makers should gear towards and how could policy makers successfully introduce frontier technology and make it effective for the, for saving the aquatic ecology of the future prabeen did you mean swasti <laughs> okay i think you definitely meant swasti <laughs> i'm so, i'm so sorry <laughs> never mind never mind swasti i think you're on board now and we are very keen to hear all your policy insights now yeah <laughs> thank you thank you prabeen and that's that's a really good and difficult question to answer i think i touched upon some of these global challenges in terms of how as policy makers we definitely need to get our head around how and i think i will come back to that same point because i think i i i'm very cautious about uh, these uh, overarching concepts of ai for social good and you know uh, uh, ethical ai because i think while these are very important initiatives in themselves we need to be very cautious about what that technology is actually being used for on ground so and when i say this uh, and this is very true of any technology uh, having worked in the technology space to a certain extent i can say that for sure that you know every technology has a maturity cycle to it and who is going to get that technology at the beginning of its maturity cycle depends a lot on what you mentioned prabeen in terms of how we are designing the incentives and who is funding them essentially these two questions are very critical to that dialogue you know and uh, if you trace the global capital flow of any technology it is primarily driven from developed countries so uh, 
and uh, essentially what happens is that technology transfer or some sort of technical assistance to developing countries help you drive those costs down in these economies and then which leads to a certain level of mass adoption and we will see that uh, to an extent in uh, the same the same story for frontier technologies in terms of managing our aquatic ecosystems as well but uh, uh, and which is why like, I will go back to the point I started with in the opening statement is that we need to constantly question who owns this data that we are collecting through these technologies. Because if these are commercial applications that are going to be deployed in pockets around the world, there is going to be an ethical question around it because these are global commons. And then that data can be leveraged for any X purposes. You know, it can be sold by uh, tech companies. It can be, uh, it can be in fact, added as a layer on to to sort of aggravate the issues that we are seeing today in terms of overfishing uh, in terms of illegal trading and all of that right so essentially uh, i think we should be very mindful of uh, when we say deployment of frontier technologies for uh, you know managing our aquatic ecosystems because that is definitely one of the key questions for me and uh, uh, i mean like one of the other things uh, and this is like the solutioning part of it, Prabhin, that you mentioned that uh, if we had to do this as a global community, how can we do that? Because uh, eventually your capital will move in that same shape and format, considering there is a technological advantage in some economies and not every nation has that advantage, right? So essentially uh, what nation states can probably then play a role is in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sort of mapping which technologies are critical to conservation efforts in their own uh, geographies, you know, and then there will be certain technologies that will sort of emerge as, you know, uh, very critical to some of these solutionings that nation states sort of design in their own action plans and in terms of their own conservation efforts. And uh, these, uh, and then the governments can definitely a start with, you know, sort of uh, providing SOPs to people who are helping drive down the cost in terms of mass adoption. But I think in this piece, the most critical thing that's going to be in terms of what value are these technologies creating for local communities, as KP mentioned, because if you can unlock that value creation and the potential of the technology at the local level, then you don't need to subsidize those technologies for mass adoption, right? It essentially unlocks the value that uh, if, if you, if you, provide that capacity building through through your uh, innovation missions or through your you know state capacity building programs then what you essentially do is you deploy that technology as a pilot to uh, uh, to increase either the livelihoods or, of people or sort of provide a secure uh, uh, you know way of uh, secure and sustainable way of say uh, you know uh, 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 you know uh, 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 making use of some of those resources that we are talking about uh, and then that value is that value that that technology deployment creates for those local communities sort of then becomes the critical mass that will help it sustain its own journey you know so essentially and this is something that we are seeing in like uh, even in india to an extent that there are coastal communities who are leveraging some of these technology solutions in terms of weather forecast and you know uh, when to venture out in the sea when to not and uh, Although initially there were these were technologies that were sort of uh, subsidized by the government, today you don't see that happening. It it sort of sustains its own momentum once uh, communities see that value unlocking at the uh, you know at the at the uh, base of the pyramid. So I think we need to create those solutions and think about what that technology can help unlock for these local communities, which is I think the biggest question for any nation state to answer today. Thank you, Swasti, for that. Um, and I, I think we were supposed to give 20 minutes for questions, but the panel seems to have uh, gone a little over time. But uh, the chat box is open for questions now. If anyone would like to put a question in, it would be great. We could open it for the rest of the panel. And um, till those questions flow in, if any of the panelists want to put in a concluding remark, I think right now would be the perfect time. Since uh, we're all policymakers here, I think we all do understand that the endeavor of e e uh, adding aquatic ecology and uh, the frontier technology is one which is difficult, which Swasti and KP have very well mapped out. So I think through this panel, one of the biggest takeaways would be that there needs to be community engagement and there needs to be an, uh, 
a method through which the community understands the need and and, and finds itself wanting to introduce frontier technology rather than it being a top down approach a bottom up approach in which the community itself is involved in understanding how the technology will impact the ecology and is not just following directions from a state would be more effective as once there is incentive and once there is a deeper understanding on what the actions are and why these actions are being taken there is more of an innate human drive for the actions and for these communities to act in accordance to what is required so i think uh, with that in mind if anyone would like to add any concluding remarks that the floor is open and if anyone would like to post a question we could uh, you could put it up on the chat box and we'll uh, pose it to the panel yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pervin. I think you've actually highlighted a lot, couple of things. But one thing I would like to add on to it is, is that in most developing country, there's been an issue concerning centralization of power. When it comes to conservation, this has to be delegated. There has to be administrative catchments that actually empowered with the right technology in compliance or in agreement with the local community to be able to manage the water resources this is very imperative in deploying the in deploying relevant uh, frontier technology and establishing citizen observatory like i mentioned earlier and in so doing we'll be able to address the issue that has to do with human rights approach to water economic approach to water address issue that has to do with social equity or different dimension of equity that exists in community. Because you can expect the Minister of Water Resources to be down in every community at the same time. So if we have delegated approach to which enhanced technology towards managing our catchment, I think that would be the best way to be able to solve issues that has to do with every element approach towards water and also improve livelihood as well. And also um, concerning data, I think um, ownership should be delegated to the country because the country best determine their own interests based on their sovereignty rights. I think this approach should be um, should be addressed by the United Nations, despite the fact that this is uh, kind of inherent approach based on the sovereignty nature of every country. But the United Nations needs to help to support every country to have access to their own data and to also restrict the privacy nature of the data rather than capitalist approach towards data sharing and uh, data usage. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed, for that. And I think that's a really important point is that a knowledge repository which would be accessible to many developed states would not be accessible to developing states in uh, Asia and Africa. And that bridge of knowledge is one which is very pivotal to be uh, solved because of the fact that while technology existed it may not reach the right or the needed audience and uh, again talking about delegation that's a very important point whereas we know that a lot of developing states do not like to give away power i think in the state we are and i think the need of the time is that there is effective delegation because of the fact that as you mentioned there is one uh, water resource minister who cannot be everywhere and who may not be aware of all the issues and i think delegation is the only effective uh, is the solution to that but i think that delegation also comes with proper and uh, well structured methods of checks and balances which need to exist um, in regards to that the technology is actually being implemented because historically we have seen in states giving the example of india where when the funding is provided the funding has been misused so i think when we do talk about delegation, we also need to add the fact of checks and balances which are present because uh, these are large funds and these are large projects which require collective effort and even with delegation, there might be a lack of accountability which needs and thus checks and balances would solve that uh, lack of accountability which exists. And um, yeah, I think that was a great point. And if there are any other panelists who would like to add on and build on what to so you talk about or introduced any uh, introduce any other point which we would like to wrap up soon on yeah i just like to add one last point so we also have to understand that uh, policy making about aquatic ecology you know in a sort of a siloed way is not is also not sustainable we also have to understand the interactions between land and water between terrestrial use of land and how that impacts our aquatic ecosystems and how water use impacts and how agricultural water use impacts 
the health of an aquatic ecosystem. So I think that is also something that we have to consider because when we are making a policy, it's not solely about that policy itself, but also how it, again, the interconnectedness point, right? Which is something that as policy makers, we have to be informed. Uh, again, I have a quick anecdote here. Uh, so in the aftermath of the cyclone, uh, Ampun, uh, not Ampun, sorry, the older one, the 2009. Eila, uh, I think it was called a forgot the name. But yeah, so there was a village uh, in the, again, in the Sundarbans area, which was extremely ravaged by the cyclone, right? But then through technological interventions with respect to climate, uh, climate resilient agriculture and educating the local communities in making sure that uh, the way that they sort of cultivate their plants and they cultivate their crops does not adversely impact the health of the ecosystem. And that has really created a, a very, a very significant increase in their agricultural yield and sort of uh, also has empowered the local communities. And now they have a more sustainable livelihood and they are you know, closer in terms of how they interact with the nature around them. And that is also something that uh, we should consider, uh, I think. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, and I think we're about to reach the end. If there are any questions, I would, uh, which need to be directed to any of the panelists, again, the chat box is open. And I would urge everyone to join it in the conversation. Because aquatic ecology, as uh, Swasti mentioned, Water is 70% of the earth and if it, there is not effective solutions found, we do exist in a state where it could be detrimental for the future. So I think this panel is covering a lot of very important stuff because of the fact that while frontier, as has been talked about by everyone, while frontier technology does exist, frontier technology is not available and frontier technology is not accessible to the people who need it and the communities which need to implement it are not aware. And I think as policymakers, one thing which definitely does strike out is that the policies are not on implementation of the frontier technology as much as it's about making people aware and making uh, and making the communities actually understand the need and how it could be added on and how could they actually be effective in uh, using frontier technology and they could uh, basic basically coming back to the point that. It is the community and it is individuals which are unaware of frontier technology, which you usually need to apply it the most. So for a state, the biggest role is not of just funding and just researching about the uh, frontier technology. It is either actually taking the knowledge which is uh, created and implementing it successfully, implementing it efficiently so that the right people and the right communities are getting uh, the required the required technology and are implementing it and i think we have a question uh which talks about the funding of the technology um i would open up the panel if anyone wants to talk about how this funding should take place and if there is a right method or a wrong method uh of how historically this funding has taken place because if we talk about aquatic ecology funding that is something which is still new and while certain governments are investing heavily into it we also need to keep in mind certain governments cannot invest heavily into it therefore i think if the panel could take that forward and talk about how there needs to be this how funding needs to be turned into more efficient and how we could have international funding so i think if any of the panels would want to talk about it can probably take a shot at that, uh, sure. Pravin. So, one, and this is one aspect I did touch upon in my opening remark that uh, I think one of the biggest challenges of uh, deployment of any sort of frontier technology anywhere in the world is we need to be very mindful of who's funding it. Because essentially, uh, and if you look at some of these studies that are being done across the world, there are certain uh, contracts in place that, you know, th those studies are supposed to feed in a particular sort of uh, you know uh, an agenda maybe I agenda being a negative word here but I mean like sometimes it could be also big for a broader initiative at the global level but I think effectively like for example if you look at some of those uh, studies in terms of creating the 3d maps of the Caribbean seabed uh, these are studies being conducted by NOAA to uh, for specific purposes the data that they're collecting is massive you know in terms of uh, uh, around which season of the year what kind of fish species is spawning where in a particular location and that's 
very critical that's that's a critical data set in terms of our understanding of aquatic ecology and how, what are those interlinkages and interdependence within that food chain because uh, uh, i mean till we don't understand that what like for example what kind of uh, seabed flow supports what kind of fishes and then that sort of supports what kind of a coral reef ecosystem till we don't understand that i don't think we will be able to go forward in terms of evolving our understanding of how to preserve them either but essentially those data sets uh, in terms of uh, which species are spawning where at what time of the year can also be misused by uh, you know governments uh, for example to then direct uh, uh, trawlers in that particular area for fishing in a particular season so i think it's a double edged sword and that's true for any technology for any application but i think which is why what you raised as a point in terms of funding is one of the most critical pieces when we are saying uh, let's deploy technology for preservation right who is using that data and where is it being funded for are very critical questions uh, it there could be studies that are actually being funded by uh, you know labels that are uh, being used to uh, ensure that a product is sustainably fished but we don't know uh, you know so i mean these are patterns that are emerging across the world but there needs to be a lot more research in terms of how those global cap that global capital is actually moving and funding some of these researches which is why like uh, i think whenever we look at some of these data sets we should always be mindful of who's funding the, that study and what is the objective of that particular study you know uh, uh, and uh, just to give you an example for example uh, uh, noa which is uh, uh, you know uh, owns a lot of data sets in terms of uh, some of these bathymetric studies or topography studies of the seabed are actually uh, uh, are actually collaborating with amazon and amazon has recently launched uh, launched an initiative which is called amazon data sustainability initiative in which they have gone ahead and made all these data sets public uh, and they are inviting all sorts of researchers innovators to come and use these data sets and sort of uh, you know uh, innovate and develop products and solutions around it which is i think one of the initiatives that is sort of uh, pushing for more transparency uh, transparency and use of these data for data sets for global applications but it's just one of the instances most often uh, researchers don't have access to those data sets and they have to go and procure them so then uh, they are sitting in silos with ownership issues around who owns that data so i think and whether it can actually be made public for everyone so i think there's there's a whole privacy compliance and risk element involved in that question and which is why funding becomes like one of the most critical links for me as we go forward in terms of deploying these technologies uh, yeah thank you yeah. very much uh, okay yeah i was just going yeah. to say yeah so hey do you think i say to take over from now Yeah, thank you very much for the question. It's actually a very brilliant question. Who funds the technology? And I would like to say it from different angles. One, who funds the technology, and who owns the technology? Because um, a company can actually design a technology and still owns that technology, whereas the beneficiaries can just use half of the technology. What the technology can do. in terms of i'm coming from the perspective of analytics let's talk in for instance for facebook mm -hmm. facebook does have this analytics that can examine what comes on board what's what's your current status what have you been doing with facebook for the last two or five minutes or how many times you do come to facebook and through using this analytics as a, in terms of they could sell it out to co for commercial purposes they can use it to track your position so for me the funding actually determines the ownership and who funds if a foreign government is actually funding the technology they literally own the technology so what i in my own kind of instead an expert experience i feel that if any developing country is buying a technology and is getting funding for a foreign land i think there's a need for an ethical situation for them to own that technology and with the analytics of that technology and avoid the company that created the technology because i've seen a case where a particular technology was used to actually survey uh, there was a particular research that was conducted in africa i think maybe around vaccine or so and it was used to collect a lot of data but the data that was collected was not actually the data they are interested in 
it was just like, okay, we wanted to check the X status of people in this particular region. Whereas they were trying to test the effectiveness of a particular vaccine that was given to the people in the community. So, um, this was solely because the people that funded were from some European countries. So I would say the funding from the ethical perspective of data analytics to say, if you're a developing country, you're trying to use a particular technology, if the funding comes from um, a developed country, try as much as possible to ensure that you take ownership and the data analytics and the privacy of the particular uh, technology. That's my reservation. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that covered most of the points regarding that question really well. Uh, we do have another question in the chat, which is more geared towards India and how research is essential in policy making in India, which I think has already kind of been touched upon in the panel that research is critical to actually establish these policies and actually find effective solutions to the policy. But and how do you, and why do you, and the second question is why is research being undermined in India, which is uh, and another interesting question because at the state we are in India, production is given and rather than research production is given precedent. So um, if one of the panelists would like to take over and answer, try and answer that question, that would be great. I think all the panelists would be having something or the other yeah. to say on yeah. this, considering they are the GPOTS fellows. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, please, Neha, you can go ahead with this. Yeah, so I wouldn't say it's undermined because that adds a lot of uh, negative connotation to it. But I would say that uh, it is uh, not encouraged a lot. Um, that has a lot to do with the overall education uh, situation that we uh, have in our uh, country. But let me go over the entire second question that uh, Rajita has asked. So, um, okay, what I would say is uh, research, when we mean, uh, when we say research, it's let's uh, consider PhD uh, plus research, uh, PhD in ahead, any research that goes into it. Uh, so there are indeed subsidies, but then we do need more people to take a PhD and then we need more uh, grants to those people to, you know, carry out uh, their research. We need that level of infrastructure, that level of technology so that they are able to monitor, they are able to survey, do all the, the surveillance that they require for their research, etc. So um, I would say that as a nation, we are uh, developing their it is uh, catching uh, attention, but uh, there needs to be uh, more grants and we need overall awareness uh, amongst our, uh, our uh, scientific society in India uh, to, uh, you know, encourage uh, more students to take up research. And just as a plug to what Neha said, as someone who belongs to a family of scientists in India working in this very space, I just want to add on that, you know, uh, one of the main reasons, and I, I would probably take up the second part of it, because I don't necessarily think that there's lack of research. Uh, there is enough work being done on the ground and scientists in India are actually uh, one of the it's, it's, it's actually one of the few places where despite a lot of dis encouragement if that's a word but despite like a lot of disincentives scientists do typically tend to work with local communities which is a very unique model you know that in that sense uh, but i think what what we lack uh, probably uh, in the country is uh, an entire ecosystem of how academics can also play a major role in creating some of these solutions and uh, uh, you know although we see these pockets of interventions where uh, scientists are working with uh, uh, like and that's true for even agriculture not just aquatic <laughs> ecology you know uh, they're working with coastal farmers in terms of how to increase their productivity the debate till date is also around productivity rather than conservation you know uh, and uh, because we are a developing nation our uh, imperatives are very different you know uh, it's more about preserving their livelihood and also helping them uh, you know sustain their own uh, uh, just like it's hand to mouth living literally in coastal areas so how do you then encourage them to uh, get a better catch and uh, you know how how can we do that sustainably is still not a very big priority for the government which is why 
why it's not being funded either as neha mentioned you know uh, and although we have these great institutions like iits and uh, a lot of engineering colleges that are offering uh, uh, you know uh, uh, degree programs in uh, disciplines such as niche as as niche as these uh, we don't see the government then becoming a sort of enabler to set up and lay the groundwork of that ecosystem where you know uh, scientists work with local communities for uh, policy implementation and uh, uh, our engineering colleges then become like this uh, uh, you know sort of uh, thought leaders or uh, creators of those technologies that can help drive those costs down and also increase the adoption of it so i think somewhere we are failing in terms of creating that uh, uh, what we were talking about like a circular model for exchange of knowledge and laying down that ecosystem in place so uh, it's and i i completely agree that it's a problem because i think if we if what we are talking about is about delegation and uh, localization of these solutions it's it's again like one of the most important missing links in india and uh, just to add to sathi's point i think a lot of times uh, policy implementation and you know policies actually turning into actionable legislation depends quite a bit on the political will right and like sathi has mentioned the fact that our priorities as a developing country are quite different so you know so the role of political will is something that you know i wanted to just bring to your attention here as well Rachel. yeah i mean we we are we are in fact telling our research institutions in india to raise their own funds which is absurd yeah. in my mind i mean uh, if if in a developing country your government is not going to fund research who else will there's nobody else you can't raise money on your own uh, because you're still in an a, a you are you have a technological disadvantage and then if you're supposed to do pilots and commercialize them at the same time as a no research problem. institute you will fail you will fail somewhere right so i think that's one of the bigger problems in terms and it's it's a capital problem it's a funding problem is essentially yeah definitely not a talent problem because we have a lot of indians working across the globe on different uh, levels to you know enable the overall survival of mankind but yeah definitely it's a capital problem yeah i would like to chip in one thing concerning the question i'm not from india but uh, i had colleagues who have actually worked in india and i would say um because i do i also like follow up with some projects across the world there was one specific project that was conducted by giz in 2015 uh, up to date um india still have a lot of areas that still suffer from sewage problems sewage management problem is a very very tough problem in india but and india is used to a centralized wastewater management system but well, giz went on board and they conducted a serious and thorough research that gave back to a decentralized way of managing wastewater. And this actually proved to be, in fact, they went ahead to also help uh, the policy of decentralized waste management in India as of now. And they helped so many community in, um, in Dehe. And also I saw some of the templates. So I think research is actually very much uh, paramount. Most countries still rely on centralized wastewater management system, and this is really outdated. So research I've shown, most especially the GI. In fact, in GIZ, when GIZ conducted the research and they were able to put um, a lot of um, decentralized wastewater management uh, system in place and it worked it's been explored to other countries in fact i know it was in uganda that i learned of those um, uh, mission then and it was really really very great so research in policy making i think it has helped india to a large extent and most recently too there was a consortium of organizations that involved the london school of hygiene they helped some schools in um in developing a kind of decentralized system as well, because most of the sewer system in uh, in India, in Delhi and some other places are complicated and not easy to manage by the community. So they develop a kind of a friendly way um, of managing wastewater uh, systems using local technology that a lot of people actually developed. So I think there's a lot of things going on in, um, in India and a lot of researches actually have proved very much accurate using local knowledge. In fact, people from the school that was televised, I watched the clip, uh, the, was not last week, I watched the clip from a friend who sent it to me about uh, the mission of the London School of Hygiene, another sort of consortium with some schools in, in India, using simple technology to ensure accurate 
wastewater management. So I think uh, thorough research that was done by this school combined with um, the technical expertise from the London School of Hygiene have actually proved to be very, uh, very much profitable. And I think um, research is actually very much important. It has helped um, India. But one thing about it is the politics uh, disenfranchisement. I think um, if the political class can actually support some of these missions, it could actually help them in um, formulating good policies. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And um, I think on that, we have covered a lot about how frontier technology, what is the future of frontier technology in aquatic, aquatic ecosystems as it is not only, it is no longer about finding the right technology, but it is finding out how to implement the right technology in the right problems and how to actually get community engagement and actually find a way for these uh, frontier technology to reach the point where it is actually effective. And I think that all our panelists, and I thank all our panelists for providing such great insights on the same. And I, I see we've already ran out of time and we're 15 minutes over. So I think right now would be a good time for us to wrap up. And um, I would thank everyone for coming and um, spending time and giving your time to us to talk about such an important issue. And it's, I think there'll be a lot of takes, uh, a lot of takeaways from this panel. And yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you for um, joining and see everyone soon. Uh, and yeah. Uh, can we please give a few minutes to Sir Ernie get it? Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, I think you're muted. Ernie, could you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. And I um, hope I pronounced your name right. <laughs> please, uh, please guide. Um, Arani, I guess uh, it should be on the left hand bottom side of your screen. Yeah, there you would just be need a, to unmute you yourself. Just click, need to click on that. Please guide him. Can we please guide? Um, uh, in the can the host unmute him by any chance? Just try, Pravin. Yeah, um, let me try and do that. Um, text, we can text. So, Arni, I think there's a pop up. I have asked you to unmute. Yeah, I, I think there should be a pop up because I have also asked you to unmute. If you could just press unmute. We can ask sir to um, comment if he cannot um, unmute. I think he must be having some problem assessing the screen and all. Yeah, um, yeah. If he, if you want any, we you could just type out what you were saying because I think there seems to be some issue and you're not able to unmute. So if you could type out your thoughts, that would be great. I think it would be a great help for everyone attending this panel to gauge information and learn something. Yeah, sir, please type your, um, yeah, very good. There I am. Hi. Yes. Yeah, oh. can, we can hear oh, you. Yeah. yeah. What I want to say is that I have been listening to your conversation about uh, uh, the subject here. And I can tell you that in Norway, all this is organized by the government, down to the, the, the individual who are taking part in this. So I would recommend you to take a contact with the, the Norwegian government, and uh, then you will find out. Yes, definitely. I think uh, a lot of the Scandinavian countries, and, and especially Norway itself, have become pioneers of how to actually implement success, uh, how to implement this frontier technology successfully. And there are a lot of takeaways, which all the states could take from that. And I think it would be, uh, the best method would be to replicate the Norwegian model and find successes for that model 
and find some tweaks to that model to find its scalability through to larger states like India. And yes, that I think that was a great and very important point as the, as Norway becomes a leader in aquatic technology and aquatic uh, and frontier technology for aquatic ecology, and it, it is an inspiration for other states to take into account. Yeah, because we have a very high level of technology in the uh, this subject here. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to say. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, yeah, again, that was a very important point which had to be raised. And um, again, thank thank you everyone for attending this panel and giving us your time to talk about such an important issue. And I hope you guys are safe, and I hope everyone is safe from COVID, and everyone makes it through yeah. this pandemic. And we